So once you have kind of a background that you're happy with, remember that you can always get a dramatic change by just compositing something new into your background. I've been playing with, with you know, some of the artificial intelligence tools. I created a design for, for a poster a while ago that looked like this. Let's open it in Photoshop, right? And this is basically the skills we're using. And it just layered a bunch of different things to get this background like textures and different art historical paintings that I distorted and all kinds of things. But what I found interesting was when I put this into OpenAI's Dolly 2, it generated what it thought it was and gave me variations. And you, you know things are AI if, if the digital artist hasn't altered it because it has this little bar on it that's helpful. But things like this can be helpful in this instance, right? Because AI isn't good enough to work as a professional, at least for the kind of jobs I'm competing for. But there's going to be the artists that use AI for this part of their process and for their busy work and have an advantage over the artists who don't. So it's, it's always good to be aware. Just like how some people will use ChatGPT which is also by OpenAI, just like Dolly, to help them with structuring an argument for a paper, right? Or to help them structure the story structure for a novel. It can be a good process artifact to use and that can make you better. So I just did something, but it's below everything so you can't see it, so let me move it up to the top. So I just moved this in. And what's kind of crazy under the licensing rights, at least for Dolly, is that this is my image, right? It's my artificial intelligence generation. But that doesn't work well just on its own. But what I can do is just like everything else, I can blend it in. I can sync it below my layers. All these different aspects, some which come from Pixabay, some which are just using the gradient tool. And it might give my, my poster just a little extra pizzazz, right? A little extra visual interest. Which might help it stand out in the room for a final project or in the gallery for the student show. And I can also play with blending modes, which often can work better than opacity when you're doing complex decisions like this. So AI now, just like presentations on Canva, you can do text generation, text generated clip art, which uses AI to make your own images for your presentations or for social media posts. You can use it to, to augment and help your digital artwork. As long as you understand things like resolution, AI is not at high resolution unless you want to pay for it. So this is ideal for kind of a layered part of a background where low resolution isn't a big deal. Let's try soft light. Oh, that's really subtle. Let's try pin light. Yeah, and let's take it to and then this is something that I've just ended up always doing in my digital art. When it gets to this phase and you're tweaking it, you have to pick different opacity layers. And I always try to pick significant numbers just to help my, make my decision better. Because do I do 87 or do I do 83? It's like you drive yourself nuts. So instead, like my dad died at 66. So sometimes I'll use that. So yeah, that's good enough. And then my dad gives his blessing, right? Or I was born in 1977, put that in. That's enough, that kind of thing. My partner was born in 1983, I can put that in, looks good. So however you can get to the final, knowing that there's no true uh, end for any of this, you can always go back as long as you haven't flattened your image and you can make changes. But I, I kind of like that, that kind of glowing sun in the middle and then these random spirals coming out from the, from the AI. And then as you work as a designer for a while, and as a digital artist, 
you're going to start collecting your own kind of catalog of textures and backgrounds. So these are ones I've found, I've scanned, I've made myself, everything from halftone to layering ballpoint pen to scanning fabrics, taking photos in museums. And all these can be like layered up to make different backgrounds, right? Different lettering effects and styles. And then I found they were auctioning off all these discontinued bolts of fabric. And on the auction site, they were doing high resolution scans of them. And so I kept keep all of these in a folder. So it saves me scanning in a lot of interesting fabrics that can be used for, for lots of aspects in digital art. So it's not only what you can find online, it's also what you sometimes keep for yourself as a digital catalog. So once you have your background, now we want to post, or we want to create your border. Because all posters have some sort of border. I'm just going to squeeze this in a little bit. So before I can make my border, I got to crop it to my final dimensions. And I've already checked my image size. It's 16 by 20 by 350 pixels per inch. Then what I want to do is use my rulers, which you can get by hitting Command R to turn off on and off your rulers, and your Move tool, and then just bring down guides. You decide if it's a skinny border, if it's a thick border, but your borders are all go going to be white. And they don't even need to be, notice I'm not using the grid, they don't need to be perfectly, perfectly even, because this is just to give some space for the printer. And then I'm going to use a layer, a new layer I create on top of everything else. I'm going to call this my border mask. It's like cutting a mat for yourself. And I'm going to use the rectangular marquee tool. It will stick to my guides. I'll hold down shift and select all four edges. I'm holding down shift so it adds to my selection each time. And I'm not going to be deleting any pixels. What I'm doing is putting a new layer on top with this border mask. And I say edit fill with 100% white. So I don't want anyone to use solid black as their background. I don't want to use anyone to use just a solid color as their background. Always have some sort of gradient, some sort of texture, some sort of something. It will help your printing. And I want everyone to have a white border. And this white border is just floating above everything else. Like that. And check your edges. It's a way to make sure you get clean edges. It's also a way you don't get artifacts at the edge where you can't really see that when you print it, you're surprised that there's like a black line at the edge. Once you're happy with it, save it. That's your PSD. That's your working file type. Maybe you want to print it for the student show. So then you also want to make a print ready version of that. And in the class Dropbox under flatten TIFF files to print, it will remind you how to do that. But I'll tell you right now, you would go to layer, you would say flatten image, but make sure not to save it with the same name. That's the mistake I made with my earlier file. And then you say file export as more and then TIFF, TIFF. That's how we make things print ready. And then just to make sure I don't in any way overwrite my file, I'm going to put the initials PR in front of it. That stands for print ready. Then that's going to go to downloads. And this is my print ready file, which I'll just put to the desktop. Mark is purple. And then I need to save or export as a JPEG to put to Canvas.
These are big files. Be patient. Move that to the desktop. Mark that as orange. Okay, now I want to go back in my history before I flattened it. Or I can just close this, not save it, then reopen my PSD. That might be easiest. So yeah, I want to save it unsaved because I saved it before I flattened it, right? Then I go to my PSD with all the layers, open it back in PhotoP, and this is how I can get all the things I need to turn in for the assignment. This is how I can get my black type. This is how I can get my color type. And this is, of course, how I can get my finished poster, which I already got. So I've already posted my black type, but I need to post my color type. So what, how can I do that? I just turn off everything except the color type. You can put them into layer groups if you want. It might save you time. But that's my color type. That's what my color type is doing. You want to be able to identify what kind of color type you have. So I have a gradient with a fill that has a dissolve on it, which gives me that texture with a dark stroke and then an extra light stroke outside of that. And I can show any background I want for it. But ultimately, it's going to be easiest if I just use white. And then I'm going to save it as a JPEG with a different name because I want it to show clean. So export as a JPEG. But I'm going to call this my color type. Not my poster layout. And what's nice is whenever you export out saves it into downloads. It's not going to overwrite the file that you are working with within Photo, Photo P. Okay, then I can close this. I don't need to save it. It's already saved. And now in downloads, I have my color type that I can post as well. Put it to the desktop. Makes it easy to post to Canvas. And this is due next class. I don't need your text blocking sketches, but if you want to show them to me, they're great. They make your type better. But I need your black type clean, and I need your color type clean. Clean means 16 by 20 inches at 350 pixels per inch. Whether you do that through vectorizing them or not, as long as they're at resolution, they work. So this is clean color type. And sometimes the color type can look really bad just on its own. Well, that doesn't matter. It's about how it all comes together for your poster. <coughs> all right. And then, of course, shrink it down so it doesn't take up too much room. And then lastly, you're going to put your finished poster. And what does that need? It has a background and a border. And Noemi is having to do what you guys are doing because she has to make a title flag design, you know, kind of type design for her characters, for her concept. So these skills of, of designing type, coloring type, knowing what to have as a vector, what not, that helps. And these files can be quite large, but that's why we make them JPEGs. And we have to shrink their quality we can, as long as we can see them in Canvas. But let me see how large this file is. Yeah, it's 70, 77 megabytes. Usually we wouldn't post anything larger than five to Canvas, but it should be able to handle it. Mm-hmm. 